Okay, sorry to those watching online. Thank you for the uh, commenting and being a part of this. I just accidentally killed the live stream. Um, so we're back and we're gonna continue from right here. Assuming I don't uh, hit spacebar while on that page again. Okay, so uh, back to it. We talked before about several of these treatment uh, spots, these, um, I guess these uh, destinations in our train route to clean water. We have, let's say a surface water treatment plant. We've covered uh, everything up to our um, filtration and we, we did cover that. So then typically what we do is once we have our water as pretty much as clear, bless you, <laughs> pretty much as, as clear as we, uh, as we can, um, then we do our, fil uh, our uh, disinfection. Because if we're using chlorine or if we're using ultraviolet light, whatever we're using, we want to make sure that the particles are not at all um, involved in shielding the, the microbes, right? We want the microbes, just the microbes remaining um, with no, no shielding particles, no protection or anything like that. Okay, so then it kind of makes sense why we will disinfect last then. And so here, if we're doing a chemical disinfectant, typically what we'll do is we will dose it and then it will go winding through our disinfectant contactor. You see this is essentially a plug flow reactor that's by design because uh, essentially if we can let that, let's say chlorine, contact the water for some amount of time, it's a really good thing to have it in a plug flow reactor style because we don't want some to be immediately mixed from the input with the output because as we've learned that the CSTR situation, we assume it's perfect mixing. There's probably uh, some, some of the water will inevitably short circuit and immediately start, like just hit the water and then go out, right? So that dilution effect means that we have an immediate reduction, but it's not reducing it as far down as we could if we just operated a batch or this plug flow batch sort of a system, um, giving that contact time the, the whole way. Okay, from there, we would send it to the distribution system. And this, in a sense, is a little bit part of the disinfection uh, process, or it is almost a treatment process in itself because we do control the residual disinfectants. Uh, typically, uh, a little bit of free chlorine with some combined chlorine. We'll talk about that um, on its way out. Sometimes we will also add some fluoride dosing to uh, kind of check, well, first of all, for dental health, um, it's a really, really um, good thing for dental hygiene in the right amounts. Uh, it can really help protect your uh, teeth enamel. Um, so that's often added uh, as a kind of a benefit there. Fluoride, there are there is some controversy because people rightly notice that, oh, fluoride can be a problem if in particularly large amounts. Um, I think some people get confused or get um, overly concerned that, oh no, they're adding this chemical. Uh, it's a lot like Cl minus. It's in <laughs> pretty much a mineral, F minus, right? Um, you don't want to see it on your exam, but it binds nicely with your enamel and protects it pretty pretty good. Um, it's actually, you know, the, it's the same fluorine that we see in the. Uh, polyfluorinated hydrocarbons that all, people are all worked up about lately. And the reason it's nice for your teeth is because once that bonds with a calcium, it makes a very strong bond and pretty much protects it from reacting with other stuff. So that's a, that's a good thing. It's the calcium appetite in your, in your enamel, I believe, will bond there. And it's it's just very sturdy against chemical attacks. So if you then decide to drink soda, that acid is not gonna uh, leach away your calcium as easily as, um, as it could have. Okay, and sometimes we use that to do tracer tests too, because it uh, doesn't really react with much in the water um, and then the system, so we can trace it pretty reliably. So that's another benefit from 
adding fluoride. Okay, so uh, disinfection. When we talked about the infectious uh, pathogens, or infectious uh, microorganisms at infectious levels, it kind of begs a question of how do we know how many noroviruses will it take to give you a bad night? <laughs> You know, um, if you've ever had an experience of what we often call food poisoning, um, you may have actually, and actually it's more likely that you were suffering a food infection unless it was an immediate and um, like drastic response. <laughs> Usually these food infections feel pretty drastic, but um, there is a, a subtle difference between a food infection or water, I guess you could call it, um, if it comes from the water, versus food poisoning, which is what our kind of vernacular term we use. So a poison is something that is toxic to you, like that, that chemical is toxic. So they're both related to microbes because a microbe could let's say, uh, start growing in your leftovers that you left out a little too long and then put in the refrigerator and you didn't notice and it didn't start smelling bad yet, so you ate it or whatever, or maybe it did start smelling bad and you ate it anyway because you were hungry. Um, so if that had created a toxin, if there was a bacteria there creating a toxin, then it gets in, in your stomach and you immediately, your body uh, rebels and says, no, this is not good and you're sick with poisoning, essentially, that, that's a, a food poisoning. Uh, we, there is a technical dif difference between that and food infection, um, and this would be more common for like, waterborne diseases would uh, happen this way as well. I, you could poison some, a water source, but that's not as common, right? It, or it's pretty rare for microbes to grow and produce enough toxins to contaminate enough water for that to happen. Um, we do see harmful algal blooms, There's those create toxins and then that can be an irritant and you'd wanna, there, we have had cases where um, in, I think Ohio, or no, um, yeah, Cincinnati, I think had some issues a couple of years ago um, where their water treatment plant was not uh, capable of removing the cyanotoxins and they basically had to tell everybody, okay, don't shower in this, don't drink it, <laughs> uh, don't touch this water, it's uh, it's toxic. Um, so that that's a, a particular case, but typically when we're talking about like the kind of disease aspect of things, you'll have a waterborne disease, you could also get a lot of these from a foodborne. And the reason I know so much about this particular topic is I cross-enrolled as a grad student into a public health course on environmental microbiology. And that's where I learned, it's kind of, um, they had some CDC people come and give uh, lectures as part of that course. And I learned that the way you actually measure how many noroviruses does it take to infect somebody? Have you ever thought about that? Like, how, how would you know that? <laughs> how are you gonna count that? What they, what they do, and by the way, it doesn't take too many noroviruses. So, I don't know, five to 10 range viruses to give you an infection for most of these. I don't remember polio. Um, polio is, a, um, is another one of these food or waterborne diseases, and it's that fecal oral route of transmission. So you excrete some, you know, somebody excretes it, and then you accidentally ingest that, and you have a problem. So for example, several years back chipotle was in trouble for norovirus and some other things and what that usually means is they had a worker at that particular uh place who was sick and either didn't know it or came to work anyway um and then did not have proper hygiene and then that's now in your food and there's an outbreak right so pretty gross um but that's that's the way of it um and so the way you the way you figure out how many it takes is you get a bunch of volunteers, probably like a bunch of young, healthy people who would be happy to maybe get sick for a week if you pay them enough. 
and you you recruit some volunteers and then you say okay everybody's gonna we're gonna feed you for the next four days so we control your diet we're gonna have have this nice little medical hotel situation we'll take good care of you um and you'll have a tv whatever wi-fi anything you want but we're just gonna keep you kind of safe and like you're, you're gonna you're gonna hang out here and we're just gonna control, control whatever you eat um so we know that you know not to control the experiment essentially and then you're like okay and you'll get a thousand bucks right so it's like i'm gonna pay you a thousand bucks and we're gonna give you this pill by the way or this little little you know little thing to drink or something and um we're not going to tell you but it, it might be placebo and you're just lucky you get free money and food um it might have two viruses in it or approximately you know something like that uh, maybe it'll have a hundred and you're probably going to get sick maybe it'll have a thousand you know we're testing these things or maybe you will uh you will get the infection but you'll be asymptomatic so lucky you right so they're going to track all these things and they can then they'll probably be testing your um your your ways to check to see if there are viruses in it and stuff and see if you have the infection or whatever so they'll gather that data based on volunteers that they're paying to to maybe come get sick and then when you think about it like, would i do that <laughs> <laughs> see exactly uh so we had a question here is this the same principle um involved with having to be uh close to a person ex for extended time uh to contract covid a certain dose of the virus uh, yeah so the kind of that dose response principle um it's it's a that's a very good question it's an interesting concept because for something like covid it's a or any really any airborne um, pathogens it's a little bit harder to tell uh if let's say if one cell gets infected by one virus um that may be able to spread especially if it's like in your lungs and then you exhale then it spreads through further through your lungs so there's i've heard some people and I, dr bivens might know this better uh, than i do but um i remember he he mentioned to me at one point that that theory of the the dose mattering may or may not make sense i think he was saying it probably does not make sense because as soon as one cell uh, erupts and viruses start spreading the in infection will ensue now, maybe there's something to be said about how fast it's going to happen compared to how quickly your body starts responding. So it, I think there's potential for that, for the, the dosing to have some relevance, but I don't know. And I'm also not quite sure. Um, maybe there would be a way to, to measure that with this type of like, here, I'm going to inhale this <laughs> and we're going to see how quickly you get sick, right? Um, or how badly you get sick. Uh, so I'm not sure, but it, that principle could be at play. When it comes to like these observations for ingestion, usually what it's what we're really uh, noticing is some of the things like Vibrio cholera I mentioned already. Um, it actually takes like tens of millions um, or more. So. I think it's greater than a million, pretty much, um, to give you an infection because so many of the, the bacteria die in the stomach acid. They're very vulnerable to acid. So a, a take home there is if you are going to eat raw oysters, which, by the way, are really effective filters of water. And so any of the wastewater that happened to be upstream carrying these pathogens are going to filter them out and the bacteria like to just stick there in the, the fleshy bits and just stay and and live and then you put them on ice keep the bacteria nice and preserved so they'll, they'll stay healthy and happy and in a nice moist environment uh, until you eat them raw uh, so if you're going to eat raw oysters do it on an empty stomach <laughs> give yourself a, a little more defense there because <laughs> that is definitely a way that we're cholera can be um, transferred and probably most if not all the cases we get in the states are going to be well it, travel aside related to um, ingestion of raw uh, raw shellfish um, you can get other things that way too norovirus for sure um, uh, just good luck on that you know I don't know if empty stomach will matter too much it probably would help um, still but 
Yeah, so, it, so in some sense, the difference here is that a stomach acid might kill enough of them or damage enough of the microbes. And then maybe, you know, so the question about COVID um, or respiratory diseases, I think, I think it might be relevant, but there's a little bit of a difference there. Um, e. coli, I think, was on the order of 10 to the 4th to 10 to the 6th range, maybe. So 10,000 to a million should do the job for the pathogenic E. coli. Um, Salmonella was something like that as well. I don't remember the exact numbers, but I remember that was... Um, those are sort of the ranges where Vibrio was one of the more um, required, it was one of the more vulnerable ones to acid. Um, another thing about this is these pathogens will, in, in essence, um, act according to their needs in terms of how do I get an, the next host, right? So if, if you get infected, the goal of this um, pathogen is to reproduce itself and then find another host and reproduce itself there. So the fact that cholera needs so many bacteria, it then makes sense that they produce quite a lot of bacteria and also their um, the, the disease itself causes its host to excrete a whole lot of those. Um, and so you get quite a lot of liquid with high concentrations of Vibrio cholera from somebody who's sick with it. Uh, protozoa are another category. So one one of the things I'm, I, I didn't mention yet, but what we're doing here is we're taking a look at kind of, okay, well, how do we know how many it's gonna take? How many does it take? And then uh, kind of what do we do about it in a sense from a disinfection strategy? Well, viruses are hard to remove physically. They're very, very small. We can't see them with uh, visible like photons. We'd have to do something um, even bacteria are difficult. This would be a electron micrograph, and you can see this is one micrometer here. Uh, so a you know a thousand times smaller than that is one nanometer, and viruses are on the order of like twenty to thirty, maybe fifty nanometers. Okay, so a virus then would be like smaller than that little dot um, compared to these bacteria. So with um, with viruses. Our filtration techniques typically won't get them. Maybe we'll cause some of them to be a little sticky, stick to stuff during the coagulation and stuff, but generally they're gonna be suspended. They're gonna be uh, untouched by most of the stuff until disinfection. And so chemical disinfectants are pretty good against viruses because they're essentially just proteins that are just hanging out there. Uh, they don't have much protection. A bacteria has at least that cell membrane. So if we remember back to microbiology, we've got a bit of a, a cell membrane there, like a lipid layer, it serves as some protection. So it will take chlorine a little longer to attack and get through the that lipid membrane and kill a bacteria than it would for a virus. Protozoa, on the other hand, these are eukaryotic. Um, which means they have a cell wall, not a cell membrane. So they are um, like, you know, all animals are eukaryotic. They have eukaryotic cells. They are um, cells, not bacteria in, in a sense, even though they are single cell organisms. I mean, I guess bacteria is a cell, but um, they, they have that cell wall. So they have more stuff protecting them from the environment. Um, and they can also form cysts. And so they are especially protected against the environment if they do form the cysts. A few bacteria can do that as well, um, but they don't have quite as strong of a uh, cell wall and, and, and all that. So, so these protozoa then, um, these are like amoeba, cryptosporidium, giardia, those types of things. Um, these usually take one to five um, cells for an infection uh, will do the job. So pretty much if they're there, you're probably getting sick. Um, and this is, uh, again, we've learned in the same manner. Um, and these are, these, organi these uh, diseases, cryptosporidiosis and giardiasis, are what some people uh, recognize as like hiker's diarrhea or whatever, like 
like if if you go hiking and you drink from a stream that's not particularly protected, you know, it's not coming straight out of the ground or whatever, and there's been some animals that, uh, upstream and happens to have a little bit of crypto in it or giardia, then you probably have some watery diarrhea for a few months um, while you deal with that infection. So all this, um, the dose makes the poison. Uh, that's that concept, right? If, if it's not an infectious level, if we inactivate enough of them so that there's maybe just one cryptosporidium spore for every 10 cubic meters of water that you're shipping out to your community, is probably that's that's probably a safe level, right? It's very would be very uncommon for somebody to actually get infected by that one in you know, 10, uh, 10 cubic meters. Um, however, if you're starting with one every liter, that's that's probably not a good <laughs> not a good spot to be in. Um, yeah. Okay. So then um, some of these some of these, by the way, uh, the their infection does involve them producing toxins once they're inside some of the bacteria. So like there's a E. coli and salmonella, some of those have a particular toxin that they will produce. And we actually have typically lots of these fecal gut bacteria in us, E. coli included, but it's in the right place. It's in the large intestine. It's not in the upper tracts of the in, you know, upper intestines and all that. And so just having them in the wrong place is, 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 is no good. Okay, so a little bit of uh, history here. Um, the the so-called father of dis father of um, epidemiology is John Snow, uh, not not this guy. It's the one with the H. Um, the other one, the other one is um, more like my my brother, who's Jonathan without the uh, without the H. Um, he didn't have any children, so I'm not a direct relative. Um, so, but I mean, if you look at them, you know, who do I resemble more? Don't answer that. Uh, I am starting to, to, you know, receding hairline and all. Um, uh, but anyway, so he's a famous guy from 1850s, 60s. He was a medical doctor uh, and he was investigating this cholera outbreak in London. Uh, you may have heard of the, the Broad Street Pump. Uh, essentially, um, there's, a, there's actually a really nice telling of this story in a book called The Ghost Map. Um, and this guy was really the first person to kind of confirm or like really provide some initial evidence for the germ theory of disease. Um, that was a, a big medical breakthrough when we realized there's these small things that cause disease. <laughs> so how, how scary is that when you like, you get diseases and you have no idea, you can't see it, you can't feel it, like it's just people get sick, right? Um, with, with COVID, we kind of knew a lot about it and, you know, maybe too much uh, in, a, in a sense and information overload and all that. But like, if you had no reason to point to, that would be, that would be pretty scary. Okay, so this, I, I highly recommend you read this book as anybody working in kind of environmental water sort of stuff. It's a enjoyable fiction retelling it, well they the fiction aspect of it is they've added it added like conversations and dialogue and stuff that was is just imagined right but the the facts of the story are true like the amount of people the locations who was involved that stuff's true but they tell it as a story so they've fictionalized it to to tell a story so it's a really good rendition um and essentially i think this is the back cover or inner cover this is the map um, and I'll show a better image in a moment, but this is a, a map of a kind of couple neighborhoods or a neighborhood area in London in the 1850s. Um, and these black bars here um, are essentially where the, the name comes from. These are the ghosts, these are dead people. These are how many people died in this cholera outbreak that was ravaging this little area uh, in London. Of course, 1850s in London was not a great time to be there in a sense. I mean, obviously it was better than other opportunities people had, but, um, you know, hygiene and infrastructure were lacking. People were not, <laughs> right? There was a whole bunch of people 
not much in the way of sewerage or other um, basic facilities. So I'm going to show it this way. Somebody has created this map, and this is a map, the same map, just put on its side and highlighted these the ghosts, um, the tick marks marking deaths. Um, and this is per household, by the way. So, and this was the big innovation Jon Snow uh, really did was took, he created a map of, okay, where are people dying? Where is this affecting? Because what they were, they were really trying to find out what happened and why. And so essentially um, these blue markers, um, I'm, I think were added later or you know, I'm, not, I'm not sure if he put them on his map, but he would have known. And I think he eventually did take a look at that because essentially what happened was these are pumps. So these are well, well water pumps. They're essentially taking water, groundwater, and this is like a hand crank pump. And what ultimately he recognized was the, um, the pumps here, uh, this one in particular, the Broad Street pump, was really central to the outbreak. Now you had all these other pumps and some people, some deaths out in the outskirts around there, but really the outbreak was centered around this pump. And then what he decided to do was remove the handle to that pump so nobody could use that one anymore and that stopped the outbreak. Um, and so essentially what, what was going on is, well, cholera, first of all, the way, the why it's killing, you know, so many people in a given household, that's, you know, must have been horrifying um, beyond beyond words to see like, because the, the thing about cholera is it kills within about a day or so if you don't know how to treat it. In modern medicine, we know what to do. It's almost never fatal, um, assuming we have supplies. Um, essentially dehydrates you. So the cholera bacteria, um, again, thinking about how it's going to find its new host, given that it needs a lot of itself out there, essentially what it does is it takes your, your small intestine, uh, maybe your large intestine as well, and typically the, the function of our intestines, uh, one of the major functions, is to extract water from whatever's inside. So it's going to pull water out from whatever we have in our stomachs, or in our intestines and into the bloodstream. So that's a, that's a common function, it's a normal function. Well, cholera takes a hold of that system and reverses it. And this is why we get, um, you'll have a cholera cot specifically designed for cholera patients who are dealing with that because it's essentially draining all your liquid out your bottle, right? So the cholera cot is there to catch all this liquid and it's, you know, very, very large amounts of liquid excreted as waste. And so essentially that means if you don't know how to hydrate, if you don't have hydration salts, if you don't have access to an IV or something like that, um, then dehydration can kill you very quickly. So you'll see people go from happy and healthy one day to hours later, emaciated, like a dehydrated type of emaciated. And, um, on death's door. So it's, it's um, I've heard a terrifying type of thing. Fortunately, with, um, you know, something like Gatorade or a better, you know, I think there's hydration salts more specifically, but even Gatorade would probably solve most, most issues in the modern day, right? Even if you get like a, just a stomach bug of some sort, you drink some Gatorade if you, if you have diarrhea, because it's good to replenish that, you'll feel better, keep you healthier. So cholera is extreme with an IV or even just hydration salts and water. It's like almost a non-issue now, but for them, it was like, this happened in days, like a few days. So it's not like, you know, and COVID was, uh, you know, there were obviously horror stories and terrible people lost loved ones, but this is like in your neighborhood, people just dropping like flies. It's just a completely different scale. So once, once they figured that out, that was a, a huge deal to understand. Ultimately, the story goes, what, what we learned was that the, um, the source was actually an infant that had come in from some travel from some, somewhere else. And infant stomach was not developed so far, you know, so the cholera actually wasn't infecting it, affecting the infant as badly. So it was like a continual source. And this was at 
this was in a home that was butted up right next to the the well for that pump at the Broad Street pump, and the, their drainage was surprise surprise going straight down into the well water. Um, so pretty nasty in the first place. But the fact that that infant had cholera and had a continued infection, but prolonged infection, means there there was a constant source. Um, I think that infant might have even survived. I don't I don't know if we know for sure, um, but that that was sort of a continual source of the disease into that well um, uh, and a direct one. So this was like the first time we ever tied that, that source of the disease. And ultimately, John Snow had seen, he was looking at it like through a microscope or something, and he thought he saw little particles floating around in there. It turns out he probably actually didn't see bacteria, but it, he thought he did. You know, essentially he thought he did, and he thought that's what it was. And he was right, even if his microscope probably didn't give him enough magnification. So his theory was turned out to be correct, and that was a, a major a major deal because this is sort of the first time we had that um, to map a disease. That's sort of epidemiology, mapping the rate of some infection or some outcome um, to learn something about it, its source, and to deal with it. So that's uh, epidemiology uh, in it, from its roots there. So definitely an interesting story. Check out the ghost map. Um, it's an easy and uh, fascinating read. Okay, uh, so disinfection. Uh, what technologies and strategies do we have? And kind of what are their, their basic principles here? We'll cover this. We'll get more in depth into both chlorine and UV in the next couple lectures. Um, we'll probably next time if I if I get your grades done by Thursday, we'll, we'll probably go over the exam, but um, for the next few lectures, um, we'll kind of take a closer look at, um, we'll take a look at chlorine today, take a closer look at UV, um, and may get into some of the advanced oxidation. So free chlorine uh, essentially is often applied as either chlorine gas, which then can react with water. So if we do Cl2 plus H2O, we will end up getting um, some HCl, so we add some acid in that sense, and some HOCl. So the HOCl, <clears throat> this is our free chlorine. Um, if we add NaOCl or CaOCl2, we, we could say this NaOCl, for example, would dissolve and dissociate into sodium and OCl minus. And so OCl minus and HOCl are um, essentially in equilibrium with each other. That's gonna depend on the pH of the water. They are, the combination of them both is what we call free chlorine. So uh, free chlorine then is really OCl minus and HOCl. We can apply it in different forms. Um, just do this. But the combination of those two molecules are essentially um, what we're looking at. Uh, and I guess I had the space to write that up. I'll just do CA, CL. So this guy would dissociate into two plus, CA two plus and OCL, two OCL minus. Okay, so regardless of which way we form it, one thing I, I want you to remember here is that essentially, and I'm sorry, I meant to shift these up. I'm gonna fix that later. Um, essentially, HOCl is gonna be in equilibrium with OCL minus and H plus. Okay, so we need to remember some of our equilibrium chemistry here. Uh, did I did I give you guys a, a bit of a refresher on that earlier in the semester? Did I skip over that? I did okay, good. So we'll we'll have a little practice uh, either today or next time on that as well. Um, but essentially, this equilibrium we have a known equilibrium constant, Ka, for that, and that means that we can know. We know the pH, we know what fraction is going to be HOCl versus OCl minus. And that's pretty important because 
HOCl is the stronger disinfectant. So that's the one we really care about almost all the time. Turns out it's like, I forgot how much, but it's like around 10 times stronger. So we would need 10 times the amount of OCL minus, um, something like that. Okay, so then we also have combined chlorine. Uh, so combined chlorine, what that refers to is essentially chlorine that has reacted with nitrogen uh, to form a chloric, chloramine. Um, so some sort of nitrogen group, probably an amine group or amino something, and the chlorine reacts with it. And so we get some form of NHCl um, where we have some number of NHs or yeah, some some number of H's on the NH and some number of chlorines uh, substituted in there. Um, actually, I, th I think this OCL there. But, um, essentially, some some ratio of the two. We'll we'll clarify that later. Uh, but that's kind of the base. The base way to understand it is we can have monochloramine, dichloramine, trichloramine based on how much based on that ratio there. We'll, we'll come back to that later. We also have chlorine dioxide, which we can use. So ClO2, um, this itself is a disinfectant. So while maybe there's some reactions that can bring it into free chlorine, this is sort of a, a different style of chlorination. It's also a strong oxidant. Um, it's kind of no surprise there. Um, so that would, that could be, I guess a third application of chlorine that can be used. Um, and finally, for the chemical disinfectants, we also have ozone. Um, there are some, I guess, uh, a few others, a little more, uh, a little newer ones I could add here. Um, so this is not exhaustive. There's a uh, parasitic acid that's been used, especially for wastewater recently. Um, basically, that's hydrogen peroxide with vinegar um, paired, um, acetic acid. But ozone uh, would be our our last one that's very common or I guess uh, conventionally used for both uh, drinking and wastewater treatment. So ozone itself is natural oxidant. There's a little bit in our atmosphere down here. We don't like having it down here um, in our lower atmosphere because it's a, an irritant oxidant, bothers our lungs, causes problems with asthma. Um, in the upper atmosphere, it's great because it's doing a lot of good photochemistry for us, removing a lot of harmful UV rays. So there's a, we like it some places, not so much in the troposphere, rather in the stratosphere. Um, we can use UV light directly, speaking of. Um, this can then denature some of the proteins in a way, uh, cause dimerizations, we'll talk about that. Um, and then, we have another category where we might combine some of these things like UV and ozone or UV and peroxide um, to achieve what we call advanced oxidation. And this is, while it, it certainly would disinfect, that's not usually its target because um, it would kind of be overkill. It's like a really, really harsh environment. It's usually more so reserved to get rid of pharmaceuticals or other uh, contaminants that are what we would call recalcitrant we can't destroy them with just some chlorine or something. Um, so this can, um, this would be like highly oxidizing So this is more so a treatment for pharmaceuticals and the like. So if we, we're worried about pesticides getting into our water supply, for example, and we know that none of the other processes in our treatment system can take care of that, well, maybe we add an advanced oxidation step as sort of a tertiary treatment, and that cleans it up and destroys those, uh, creating uh, you know, safer conditions for, for that. <clears throat> 
Okay, so free chlorine. Talked a little bit about it. Um, essentially, as I mentioned, HOCl is stronger than OCl minus. So we typically will want to operate our treatment plants or our chlorination, we're using free chlorine in a slightly acidic environment because this equilibrium for OCl minus and HOCl is driven left or right on, on this equation here based on the amount of hydrogen that's there, right? That's the acidity. So if we had a, let's say a plot where we have some fraction of free chlorine, versus we have pH on the bottom here. And I'm just gonna draw this out real quick. Maybe I have this already drawn somewhere. Got a question here as well. Um, so I'm gonna read this question. Is photocatalytic oxidation for air purification considered one of those advanced oxidation treat uh, techniques? Um, it's a great question. Um, and I do deal with a lot of photocatalysis uh, with my research, so I'll, I will um, I can definitely add some of that to our one of our next discussions on um, maybe the UV section to talk about photocatalysis. Now, for air purification, of course, that's going to be you know outside the context of our um, water treatment. But yes, that would be essentially an advanced oxidation treatment. So photocatalysis, basically, you're, you're taking light and you're going to uh, excite a catalyst of some sort that's photoactive. It can receive that light, it gets excited, and typically what you'll have is a splitting of uh, an electron in the base material to pop up into the um, conduction band from the, the valence band that's just from that material, pops up, up into conduction. So this is a lot like photovoltaics where then that could travel and feed some electricity. Um, instead, you get, uh, essentially a hole where the electron left and that electron itself they're both very very reactive and so they can assuming you can prevent them from recombining um, they can both do what's essentially known as advanced oxidation they're highly reactive so you could get some reduction but usually that hole is very oxidizing and you could have them react with let's say just oxygen in water or in air so it can be used for either and then you get radicals like hydroxyl radicals, which are very strong oxidants and will react with almost anything. So yes, that is a, that's a great question, and that's like um, one of one of my research aims in general. Um, if anybody's interested, is to find ways to make it more practical to apply photocatalysts for water treatment, because you can potentially then just use light, uh, sunlight, um, or or something, and get these free disinfectants in a way, but it's just really hard to design a system where you have enough light hitting your material, enough proximity from your material to whatever you're trying to treat, because most of this is happening on the surface, and then also keep the catalyst in place, right? So there's a lot of physics involved that makes mass transfer, light transfer, all that technically challenging. And then you have a problem if you've got organic matter, it'll just want to react with that instead of like your targeted stuff. So there's a lot of challenges that we, we work through with, with um, my research group there for disinfection or for kind of destroying some sort of a pharmaceutical. Okay, so um, thank you for the question. Back to this part here. Um, if we look at the fraction that is one thing or the other, and I'll, I'll use two different colors here. Let's say the fraction that is HOCl, and if this is like 100% here, let's we'll say one, then um, essentially we have approximately all of it as HOCl here. And then as we're approaching our cutoff point or our, uh, our equilibrium point, it's decreasing until this is approximately zero. I didn't draw that great, but the, um, our Ka in this case is um, 10 to the negative 7.54. Or we can say pKa, if you remember the, uh, that P as a uh, 
prefix in a way, that would just mean this is pKa is 7.54. And that's defining for us then the pH where these two are equal. So if I use a different color here and say, okay, then the OCL minus, we'll do the same thing in reverse. It's approximately 100% OCL minus. Did not draw that particularly well, but you kind of get the picture, right? It should be sort of a that shape. Um, so that means that at one spot, they're both equal to each other. For the rest of it, of the pH, if we're slightly acidic, you know, let's say that pH five to six range, then we have mostly HOCl and we're, we're happy with that, right? So at pH five to six, we're somewhere in this range and that's like 90 plus percent HOCl. Can't quite tell the way I drew it, but that, if we do the math, that, that would work out. And remember, that's the our equilibrium is defined by that those products over the reactants, right? So the um, what this looks like mathematically is this, where that's like a to the a times b to the b molar concentrations here we don't always have a b c and d um, so in this case it would be um, 10 to the negative 7.54 equals h plus times OCL minus divided by HOCL. Okay, and so one thing we could take a look at is um, at what point are these two the same? We could rewrite this as 10 to the negative, you know, I'm just going to actually leave it as Ka for a moment, and I'll just leave that. 10 to the negative 7.54. Let's go ahead and divide that by the H plus. And we see that's set equal to this OCL minus divided by HOCL. So if I were to ask you at what pH are these two on the right equal? Well, it's at whatever pH makes that right side equal to one right because anything over itself is one so if ocl minus is equal to hocl then the right side is one so that's the easy way of saying when are they equal and then the answer then is when these two over here are equal so that means uh at ph 7.54 um And that, that same logic applies to all sorts of equilibrium reactions. Um, but I wanted to demonstrate that. So then if we think about it, if we're adding more of the acid, more H+, plus, that drives the reaction left. And so in acidic conditions, we get more HOCl is the way that works. So that means when we operate at pH 5 to 6 range, we're definitely under the equilibrium point, which is just a little offset from 7, um, meaning we get 90, 95% HOCl, which is the strong stuff, so we're getting good value and we only had to adjust the pH a little bit. Okay, so that's a, that's the essence of why we do it. Um, that also means typically we'll probably want to readjust the pH, get it a little closer to neutral once we're sending it out through our pipes. Uh, but it's definitely a good value there to, to do. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a few minutes to work on this problem, and we can resume here next time. It says, if 15 milligrams per liter of HOCl is added to a potable water supply um, for disinfection, and the final measured pH is 7, 
Um, that means like any acidity that we may have added if we're doing like adding Cl2 gas adds a little acidity. It's just referring to that, right? So it's the pH is seven. Um, what percent of HOCl is not dissociated? And then assume the temperature is 25. That's, that's referring to the Ka is technically temperature dependent. I'm just gonna say, let's use Ka equal to seven, uh, 10 to the minus 7.54. So technically the Ka would change a little bit with temperature. Um, it doesn't change a whole lot. So most of the class, I'm just gonna kind of pretend that's just constant. When it says not dissociated, consider again the reaction here where we are dissociating or reassociating with from HOCl into H plus and OCl minus. So the moving to the right would be dissociating, and I guess we would maybe call it reassociating, <laughs> moving to the left. So really that's just a fancy way of saying, okay, how much HOCl is in solution.
So I took one approach here. We'll, I'll just talk it through real quick. Um, there's really a couple of different ways you can approach this. You don't have to take the exact route I did because at the end of the day, it's you're essentially looking at fractions, and you could maybe derive. You could you could put in a substitute number and say, okay, I'll just say there's a total of 10 grams per liter, and then calculate a, everything exactly. That's a valid approach. If you want to do it that way, like in your head, then you can say, or like say one mole per liter or something, you know, and, and just look at the fractions that way. Essentially, the algebra will ultimately work out the same if you do it correctly, whatever approach you take. And so what I did was I said, well, the fraction I'm looking for is, well, first of all, we have the fraction of total. The, the total we have to know is OCL minus plus HOCL. Right. And we know that's going to be a molar total in terms of when we talk about dissociation or, or whatever, the number of molecules are going to stay the same. The total number of free chlorine is the same regardless, and that's going to be the sum of the HOCl and the OCl minus. So that's the first principle we kind of have to have uh, there. And that gives us this equation, say, what fraction did not associate? Well, that's the HOCl concentration divided by the the total, which is HOCl plus OCl minus. So that's that total gave us that times 100%. Um, and so I decided to simplify that a little bit. If we divide the top and the bottom by HOCl, it gets us 1 over 1 plus OCl minus divided by HOCl. That's not very intuitive. I've gone through a problem, I think, on the, our first or second homework where we did that. Um, if I didn't, I'll uh, we can I can show you that problem. Um, I get confused because I gave it to my other class and I'm not sure if I gave it to you guys. Um, but there's a like that that's not a very intuitive step, but you could probably get there from a different way, like I said, if you were trying just adding the numbers or something. Then once I see that, I say, oh well, I know I can get some ratio there in the form of my other equation. So I'm using a system of equations, right? I've got one equation for the total that I'm looking to solve. And then this other equation that I know something about the ratios. So the, the Ka and the H plus is always going to be able to tell us something about the ratio. So we get a ratio of those two. We know a ratio of these two. So And maybe you could have just started from there and said, oh, the ratio is such and such. And then you think back and calculate it. At any rate, whatever way you do it, you should get 77.6%. Um, once you put in the numbers and solve that way. All right. So we'll see you guys on Thursday. I'll try to get your exams done for that.